Welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional, an open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Time to Pet. What does it mean to show empathy to your clients? It's a way of connecting with the nervous ones, and it's a way of helping those to make sure that they feel like they're not alone and they're fully understood and can connect with your services and the value that you bring to them. Today, Stephanie Castro, owner at Stay Home Pet Sitting, joins the show to talk about implementing empathy in her business for not just her clients, but her staff as well. She also talks about why she works with special needs pets and the importance of using the right language when communicating with their owners. Let's get started. Yes, first off, thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. And so my name is Stephanie. I have a pet sitting business in the central part of Houston. It started in June of 2014. And we do pet sitting for all sorts of pets. We come out to you so that the pet stays in their space stress-free in their home. (laughs) So started in June of 2014. What happened around that time that made you decide, I need to go into pet care? Oh, this is a great story. So I say it started with an explosion. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So um, back then I had a dog named Dodger Bear. He was half Great Dane, half Pit Bull. And every time I traveled, I would take him to my parents' house. I dropped him off there. He loved going there. He enjoyed it. But this time, the whole family was traveling. My sister was graduating from San Diego, and we were all going. So I thought, no big deal. I'll just board him at the doggy daycare where they clip his nails and he goes during the day for a couple hours and plays. So I drop him off and they call me. I fly into into San Diego and they call me and they say, you need to come pick up Dodger. He's not feeling well. He hasn't eaten and he has what you call explosive diarrhea. Oh. It's exactly what it sounds like. You can Google it. <laughs> I was like, okay, don't, I still have. <laughs> don't Google that. No, actually. <laughs> Google it. I, I still had a graduation to attend. So I thought I called my girlfriend and she's like, I'll go grab him. So she went to pick him up because I think something's wrong. I need to take him to the vet. Um, he was a rescue. So he just panicked. Poor guy. Anxiety. Um, probably freaked out that I left him. Because they kennel them at night um, in their own separate kennels. So she sent me pictures. And if I can explain it, it was it was on the wall, on the curtains, on the side. It was everywhere. Wow. And so that is when I realized, okay, this would have been so much better for Dodger if he would have just stayed home. And if somebody, not necessarily my mom or my sister, because we were all going, but somebody would have dropped in to take care of him. Oh, and and those kind of, so how how does that shape how you approach pet care now, having gone through that experience when you are talking with pet parents and, and dealing with them? What does that change? How what has that changed about how you interact with them? My empathy kicks in. So mm. this is where... I can't tell you how, and it doesn't have to be a dog. There's cat owners, there's bird owners where they're just nervous. One, they're nervous on having somebody enter their home. And I started this business eight and a half years ago. So there wasn't so much people coming in your house. Right now, there's a little bit more of that. Um, So it's just, I can put myself in their shoes and remember what it felt like. Yeah, I I just did a meet and greet today with a lady who was very nervous about this idea of having somebody come into her home. She has had uh, her children. She's had grandchildren. She's had neighbors. Mm -hmm. She's had friends of the family come and take care of her dog over the last 10 years. And now it's the first time where she needs somebody who she doesn't know to come in. And she was visibly unsure about what this process would look like, especially when I started to describe our kind of team-based approach and multiple people and 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 just taking that big step back to and being up front with them. And I, I said, I understand this is weird, letting a stranger into your home. I, I totally get it. Here are the several things that we do to help you with that. And and that, that big word empathy is really at the core 
of that exchange, empathizing with that other person going, I know this is weird. I understand. I get it. Here, let me walk you through how I'm going to help overcome that fear for you. Because I understand it is fearful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's making them, I feel like it's helping them feel that they're not in this alone. Mm. Because not only are they needing a sitter for this, because normally they have somebody that takes care, like friends or family, but this time they need somebody. But then on top of that, someone's going to be coming in their space. Around their stuff, their things, family heirlooms, around their kids' bedroom, around all of their priceless belongings. And we have to recognize that that is, that is, that is weird. It's, it's pretty – it's normal to us. Like we don't even think a second thing about it. We just go in. We do our thing. But – we have to recognize and put ourselves back into that situation almost every single time we meet a new client and judge how comfortable is this person going to be because that can set the tone for that entire relationship with that person because they could be we could feel that they're being overbearing that they're being too nitpicky that they are you know they're over communicating on all this stuff when really what they are is they're just scared they're just nervous mm-hmm. and we can we can misjudge a lot of those signals that they're sending us unless we put ourselves back into that position Yeah. Yeah. And I usually share with them um, at the very, very beginning. I remember thinking before even this, I remember thinking, well, oh gosh, I need to get the house clean. Somebody's going to come in here. Oh my goodness. I need to like, what are they, what do I need to hide? What do I need? What do I need to lock down? I don't have cameras. You know, you start thinking about all this. Yeah. Um, But I just let them know that, and I don't like to push. I always direct them if they want to read our reviews or if they'd like to talk to one of our current clients, I mean, they're more than happy to, I think in the eight years I've had one person want to talk to one of my current clients, but outside of that, it's usually the reviews and and then just me talking to them. Yeah. Well, like you said, not being pushy in that moment, giving them time going, look, I don't need a decision right now. We've got everything we need. I'm ready to move forward. I'm okay with this. But if you need more time, that's perfectly okay. And happy to jump on another phone call, reach out when if you need anything else from here. And just giving them that space, I think helps them breathe a little bit because they don't feel like they're making this rushed decision or this person staring at me from across the table and now I've got to do something and I'm not comfortable and you don't, you know you don't nobody wants to enter into a relationship like that or or especially at a, at this prof- yeah nobody wants to be <laughs> be under pressure <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so for you so you you have a, a a team of sitters that work work under you um what's it like dealing with and, and showing empathy to them as well because it's not just you anymore right you've got people who are working in and around you such a great question so this is the part that i actually enjoy yeah not just the clients but then you have the staff so to me staff is super important They're almost, they're my clients. (laughs) I want to make sure they're happy. And I always ask them, how can I support you to make your job easier? Mm. Whether they need, you know, extra poop bags or does somebody, you know, want to have, for example, we always have to show, they don't carry business cards, but we wear our, our logo, our shirts. And in the winter, colder months, if you put a jacket on, you're covering it up. And so I always say, you need to have something that's showing our logo because on the ring cameras or the door, you know, the cameras, the the clients, I always tell them at the meeting group, you don't see our logo, our shirts, they're not with us. So I always ask the sitters, you know, do you need a jacket? Do you need a, a sweatshirt? I like to make sure also to know what's going on in their lives. What are their goals? Everybody does pet sitting for different reasons. Some want to get their pet fixed because they can't have pets at home for whatever reason. Some want to be able to get out of the house. I have some that are semi-retired or fully retired, and they want to get out of the house to just hang out with fur babies. Um, Some want to make extra money for travel, for saving, for school, just all of the above. And I just like to know what everybody's goal is and what everybody's reason for doing this is so that I can support them in that. Yeah, well, and importantly there, you did not mention um, run a pet sitting business or run my business or own my business. They're in this for their own particular reasons because many times we hire staff and we can go, why aren't they as passionate about this as I am? Why aren't they taking this as seriously as I am? Why aren't they? Why aren't they? Well, let's go back to the root cause here. 
if, and, and figure out what's actually motivating them. And that that's hard, right? Yeah, I've got to know this person on an individual basis now. I've got to treat them with different, you know, differently than the next person who, because they're they're here for different reasons, different motivations. But that's where that that work really gets started, right? There's work to hire people and now I've got to work to manage people and I've got to work to keep them and make and make sure that they're happy. Yes. So it's funny you say that. Yes. So I actually, when they, um, when they get hired and they jump on the team, I have a form. It's a Google form that I send out. That's called, who are you? Is what I named it. And huh. so all new hires fill this form out and it has questions like, What's your favorite snack? Where's your favorite place to go to lunch? What's your shirt size? You know, it's just a ton of questions that I want to know them. What are your goals, your dreams for the next, you know, three to six months? And I, the responses that I get, I get to know one likes gardening and she wants to get to a point where she can, you know, make her salad at home from her garden. The other one wants to travel more. The other one reads and it's trying to read X amount of books in a whole year. So it helps me not just get to know them, but also whenever they do a great job or I want to gift them something, I know what each one likes, their interests, and it helps me just go straight to that. For example, end of year right now, Christmas, I know exactly what to get each one. (laughs) <laughs> well, and how to connect with them or get them connected with others. I, I, we, we've just gone through onboarding several new staff members and just having conversations with them going, what do you like to do when you're not walking dogs? Like, uh, you know, obviously I know you love being here, you know, Jay, just kidding, whatever, but like, what else do you do? And I, I learned just by having those simple conversations that like four of our staff members are hardcore gamers and they play online games and they're on Twitch and they're doing all this stuff. And it took me a while to be like, well, what do I do with that information now? What do I, I know this about them. Um, well, something we can do is we can just we've got a we've got a company Slack. Let's just create a, a gaming channel and we'll put all of them in there, and anybody who's interested in games can go in there and talk about games and be a little bit more connected with one another too. Because that's mm-hmm. something that we've really kind of struggled with is how do we make a nice cohesive company culture and connections with people who never see each other or never interact with one another. So what are ways that you have found that have helped people get connected on the job when, when we're so spread out? So we actually do quarterly, I say quarterly, sometimes it's every three, four months, but we do quarterly get togethers. And I don't like to call them meetings because I, my first career in investment banking, oh my gosh, I'm like, why do we have this meeting? (laughs) (laughs) Could we have just put this on an email, you know? So I say we do these get togethers in the first hour we get together and we go through, you know, I have an agenda on, you know, let's talk about this is what's new. This is what's coming up that we're hiring. We're not hiring right now. Just what's happening in the business. The thing is we hold them at fun places. And yeah. then, so we've done bingo where we get together at this place in the first hour we do that. And then bingo starts at seven and we all play bingo. Like we have one coming up. Um, we're doing our last one of the year, which is kind of our Christmas one. And we're going to go do it at trivia night. So it's this place that we're, you know, like a bar pub and we're going to do our first hour where we get together, we talk about the business and then we do trivia night. Mm. Yeah, little things like that where it's not a whole lot of time and it's not a big ask of everybody, but it's a time to come together, see people face to face, commiserate, talk shop, and then go have fun. And I think that's really important that we are, we can provide that in in a healthy, constructive way of going. We can have fun, right? That's okay to do. We're all people, and I think that's what that boils down to is going. These are people, and I need to treat them like another human being. And and do my best to make sure that they're as filled as, as I can 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 on from my end. Yeah, and that see that's where empathy comes again because I put myself in their shoes. So because I put myself in that position, I don't want a boring meeting, <laughs> 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 right? I want it to be. I'm like, oh, no, thank you. So, but not only that, it's like I want to be able to get together with others. We talk about the similar clients where I'm like, I've been taking care of Bella. Well, you have too. What? What's the trick on getting her back in from the backyard when she doesn't want to come in? And another mm-hmm. sitter maybe does so well. Oh, well, you grab this special treat, you know, but it's you share stories about clients because you're right. We are the clients, the fur clients are all ours, but we don't work together. The pet sitters are all going at separate times. 
Yeah. It's it's a weird dynamic to know that like, oh, wow, like six people are caring for this one dog. Um, I need to find a way. That's my job now as the, as, the, as the owner, as the manager. How do I facilitate a conversation so that we're all better and that we are all learning? Because now I, when I used to be doing all of those visits, all these other people are. So how do we make sure that they stay in the loop, that they're sharing their resources, that they're sharing their tips and tricks? Like that, that part of driving that conversation of using them themselves and their team members as a resource and pointing them back to them, I, I think is huge and is a great way to do that so that they know, oh, I have questions I can go to these people and they'll do likewise to me. I did want to ask you a little bit about the kind of services that you offer as, as a business and a little bit how they're structured. Sure. So I'll start with our popular ones. Our, um, we do drop-in visits and overnight stays. Our drop-in visits are for cats, dogs, and we call them pocket pets, which <laughs> I started the business thinking it was just going to be dogs and then had cat owners reach out to me. And now we have pocket pets, which um, is reptiles, chickens, birds, guinea pigs, fish. I mean, you name it. I'm waiting for a mini horse. I'm going to be so happy when we get a mini horse. <laughs> oh my gosh. The, the first time we, we didn't, we haven't taken care of a mini horse, but we have taken care of uh, mini pot belly pigs. And that was just oh. like, everyone was so excited. I was, we we're like, everyone's doing this one. Come on, let's go. <laughs> it was so great. I love I, it. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I service the, in, I'm in Houston, Texas. So it's, and I service the, the inner loop. It's, the central part, it's very much the city. So I don't know how that'll happen, but you never know. I didn't think I'd get chickens and we, we have a couple chicken coops we take care of. <laughs> really? Oh, that's fascinating. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> and I know it's one service that you didn't list uh, were, were dog walks. And I was curious why you, you've, you've decided to not offer those. Yeah. So we decided to focus more on senior pets. We specialize in senior pets and then the other pets, like the pocket pets I mentioned. We also do overnight stays, which believe it or not, it doesn't mean just dogs. We have cats that need that interaction, that companionship. And so we also do overnights for cats. So it's a little bit less on the fitness side and more on the companionship and visit side, if that makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. And so did you... What 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 do you do when you get a request for walks, or do, or do you get requests for walks, and how do you handle that? Well, I don't offer that, but I can have this. How do you have that conversation? So first, I ask if they're trying to burn off energies. Normally, a dog. If they really are wanting the walk, it's a dog. So I ask her, is your goal to burn off energy? Do you have a Weimaraner that's you know super active that needs to burn off energy? Because if that's the case, it's not fair for me to even take that client. So yeah. I go ahead and just tell them we're not doing that. Um, but we do dog visits. They're 45 minutes long. And in that time, it includes us taking them out to potty, cuddles, you know, playtime. But even to potty, we might go around the blog, but we're not trying to burn their energy. I think that's a really key part of that question. When people ask you, flipping it back on them and going, why are you asking for that? Like, what's the purpose? Because now, because that's going to give me more information and it's going to make sure I give a much better answer other than just no. That's not mm -hmm. helpful. That's helpful for anybody. I haven't learned what their needs actually are and they have learned nothing about how I can actually help them. And so asking just one more question sometimes, two more questions is a great way to spin that back around and go, okay, here's what I can provide. Now that I have full knowledge, we get tons of requests for overnights. Uh, and that's not something that we provide. So my question is always, well, do you have a medical need or behavioral concern that you have for the dog? And usually it's, well, no, not at all. I just don't want them to be lonely. Okay, well, here's what we can provide. We can set up a this, this, this kind of schedule. And it just makes that conversation a lot more helpful and beneficial to people other than just a simple you know, no, and then moving on. Yeah. Sometimes they have an idea about what they want, but it's not necessary. They haven't thought of any other options because you're right. Sometimes. They <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, I feel like it's our job to educate them. Yes. Right. And just educate it. And believe it or not, many times they think they need a dog walker, but they end up hearing about what we offer in our service. And they're like, Oh, okay. And yeah, we have a cat inside. They weren't thinking about the cat. So while we're there, your dog's going to be able to go out and potty, but guess what? The cat's included. Yeah. And so we can take care of your cat. Your cat gets fed, litter box gets, oh, they love it. 
Yeah, <laughs> it is. They're like, oh, okay, it's like, yeah. <laughs> you can really open their eyes to those possibilities because you're right. They don't know what they don't know. Right? They're only equipped yeah. with so many terms and so many, so many, so little bit of the lingo that they've never had to use before. Now, oh, my friend said something about a dog walker. I need a dog walker. And spinning that back, you're right. Because now it's like, okay, well, I can do a whole lot more than just that. I can if you want. But also, let me talk about the cat, the fish, the pocket pets. Let me talk about the mail. Let me talk about all this other stuff that we provide. And usually by the time I finish with that kind of thing, they're going, oh, really? You'll do all that? Wow. Yes, yes. I will. <laughs> we didn't know this service was around. It's usually yeah. what I get. Yeah. And, and it is on, it is, it does fall to us at the individual level to, to assist in that educational process because they're not going to get it anywhere else. They're not. And that's where, you know, having a clear idea of what we can, what we can't provide and how we can help them. That is part of that educational process of what we can do. And so since 2014, um, you have stayed in the inner loop of Houston. I know you, you, you will go out for additional fees. Um, how have you been finding and attracting the clients that work best uh, for you in your business? So it's been organic, to be honest, up to this point. I'm about to kick off and do a little bit more marketing here and targeting on specific areas, even within the inner loop. As of right now, it's been, we're on the first page of Google. Okay. And so we get a lot of Google hits, um, Yelp. We have a lot of Yelp reviews. And then social media. So our Instagram page, our Facebook page, and our Facebook group that we have have been extremely popular. Now, are you finding it easy to communicate who your services are for and the price point that works best for them? Or what kind of push do you get any pushback from people who kind of who, who find you looking for care? No pushback. If there's any pushback on our price point, then we're just not a good match. That's the way I see it. There's there's plenty of fur babies out there and plenty of qualified pet sitters. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm like, sorry. But no, I, I feel like for the most part, it's really just the social media, the algorithm, I think, that's going on within the Instagram, at least. For sure, Instagram way more lately has... You know, we post a lot. All our sitters after each visit, do, they do a story. And our story also links to Facebook. And so our clients, our current current clients are on there. And then they're able to share. And so we end up finding a lot of people that are considering or thinking about us. They don't need us right now, but maybe, you never know, they follow us. Yes. <laughs> And then they join our Facebook group or they message, they DM on Instagram and they'll usually say, I've been following you for several months, you know, or we were moving in the area. And then um, that's how we connect. What do you think converts people from a follow on your Instagram to actually going to book? Because I know many sitters struggle with that aspect. They may go, I've got so many followers. All these people follow my account. But no, I'm not getting as much business from that. So what, what do you think it is that eventually kind of gets people down to go ahead and book with you for a service? I feel that it's me making it a lot more personable. So I, I do a lot of call to action mm. on there. So I don't just post, but I, I call to action. Follow, share, comment, send me a DM. So it's telling them, even if they're thinking about it, somehow, you know, you'll see it say like, share, forward. I also include links to our Facebook group and say, come in our Facebook group. And that one, for example, you don't have to be a client. Anybody, anywhere can join. Mm -hmm. it, it's a private group, but anyone can join. And they follow. So they start seeing what I post. The other day I posted tips. I try to put value out there. And I mentioned three tips on leaving your pets that have separation anxiety for the holidays. And I had so much feedback on that. They're like, oh, I didn't think about that. You know, oh, I'm going to try this. So I just build that, that relationship with the followers. And then as that grows and as I'm building a relationship or trust, next thing you know, our conversation goes into, can we meet for a meet and greet? <laughs> yeah, yeah it, right. it's content that engages is what I hear with that. It's content that is bringing people into 
a story or into a purpose where they are now engaged to to like, to comment, to share, to do something. They're engaging with you here. Now, all of a sudden, you are what? You're top of mind for them when something comes up, when a need arises. And so keeping them engaged and interacting with you is that way to go, okay, they, they might not need me now. They might not need me in four months or six months, but next year when they have that trip planned, I will be top of mind. And that does take posting, you know, engaging good content it doesn't always land or, or hit perfectly every time I know, I, I, I you know, just personally, but you, you just keep trying and you just keep people involved and engaged. Yeah. Oh, trust me. It's not perfect. You don't want perfect because then they're going to say, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not perfect. It's not. <laughs> well, so how how do you walk that line between going, oh, I'm going to post this because it's whatever, versus let me tweak it a little bit, let me tweak it a little bit more. How do you know when it's time to to click post? Oh my goodness! So I do a little bit of everything. Some of it is fun. It's like recently we had something happen with the water in Houston, and all I know was breaking news for a day. You couldn't drink the water, so I'm like, oh, this is good, right? So I posted this because if it if the water's not safe for us to drink, that means it's not safe for the pets to drink. Right. So it's which I'm sure all you had to do was turn on a TV, but even I don't watch a lot of TV. So I found out through my sister calling me. <laughs> and so I posted this instantly and I was like, great. I had so everybody's liking that, they're sharing it, they're like, oh my goodness, this is great. So it's just providing value. It wasn't perfect. It was my personal cat that I posted on there. Um, you know, if you I have gone down the rabbit hole of where I'm like, oh, this isn't good enough. Let me check this. Let me check that. It just delays. <laughs> <laughs> it delays, and it and it keeps it from being personal. Like what you just said of of that's one way that that's one thing that attracts people to you. It's, mm -hmm. it's personal. It's you. It's your personality. It's your sitter's personality. If we try and sanitize and scrub that out too much, it just becomes. It just blends in with the background. And so keeping yeah. it, keeping that personal touch allows us to connect with those clients who we really want to be connected with. Yeah. I, I think they love it. I, I, th I think they do, you know, but um, <laughs> I do different things. I don't know. The other day I, I also was mentioning products, pet products that, that are popular. I get a lot of cat owners that asked me about um, litter. What litter do I recommend? And so yeah. I thought, let me make a post about this, you know, or a video. Yes. Yeah. And so yeah. I made a video about the cat litter that I use. It was in my house, my cat litter, and I showed it. I mean, so that, <laughs> that wasn't pretty, but it was, to me, I think it was given off a lot of great information. It is, because again, we people start when we start to grow and trust and build that relationship with us those questions come naturally they they go who else am i going to talk to about this i don't know i could t ask my vet but i don't see them as often as i do my my pet sitter uh, my pet care provider so i'm naturally going to be more inclined to go to them and just being upfront and honest about what we have our knowledge our resources and presenting that to them and sometimes what i've done is going hey that's a really great question i don't know let me go spend 10 minutes googling and i'll send you a couple links right so sometimes that's all it is but that is yeah. huge to them because they don't have that time and they they're looking for us for, to, in a trusted way, screen through the myriad of information that's on the on the internet, and then presenting it to them in a more cohesive manner and condensing it down for them. That's invaluable to them. To me, that's just telling me, hey, listen, if this one client is asking for this, I bet you there's more that want that. So you know what I ended up doing is creating a page on my website that says items we love. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Susan, the pet gal, has this to say. Time to Pet has helped us grow exponentially. We believe the platform's features make us by far more professional than other companies who use conventional dashboards. They are the software gurus constantly developing and improving the platform based on user feedback. This decision was a good one. If you are looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. I love that that page that you have on your website. It's so straightforward and simple. And now you've built that and you have that. So now people can find it organically. Or when people go, hey, do you have recommendations for XYZ? You can go, actually, yes, I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. Glad you asked. Glad and then you send them a link. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so straightforward. So you mentioned you mentioned a little bit about the pets that you work for. They're more senior pets. They're a little more special needs pets, you know, both medically and a little bit behaviorally as well. So 
I know what's really hard with some of those pets is um, building trust with them because they've been through a lot or they haven't been through enough. And so how do you build trust with pets who are fearful for those first several times? Yeah, so this is what I actually tell all my sitters is we go at their pace. Mm. Right? So we go at the dog's pace, at the cat's pace. If the cat's hiding, we like to at least put our eyes on them, right? We don't want to make sure they're here. We know they're there, but we want to make sure they're here. <laughs> You'll find them under the you know cover somewhere, and then we leave them alone. Dogs, I actually had one that uh, was extremely fearful. Dad called me, had a bad experience with the previous company, um, and was I just heard the anxiety on the phone. And he said, mm. he's like... My dog's a sweet dog. He was golden retriever, big boy, sweet. It's just that the sitters come in and he needs to go out and he just needs some time. And I was like, okay. So I went to do that one myself. I thought I want to, I want to see this. So I went in, he lived in one of these mid rise apartments that you have to go down the hall, down the elevator outside to the dog area to use the restroom. So he said that the previous company, the sitter, I guess, was terrified of the dog barking. And so ended up locking the dog in the closet and not telling the dad. Hmm. I'm like, oh, my goodness. Okay. So when I walked in, I saw what could have been scary. The dog starts barking. What am I? Stranger danger maybe here. I'm not yeah. a dad. And he starts barking. It sounds scary. Okay. So I we do no eye contact. I don't talk to the dog. I always say, you see no dog, you hear no dog, you just go in face down because it's no threat. This is a fearful animal. Okay, so the dog was like, he went to the back bedroom. I could tell he was barking from back there. I ignored him. I fixed the dinner, do-do-do, you know, doing my thing. And our dog visits are 45 minutes long. And I noticed he laid down in the back bedroom. And I was like, okay, so I sat down in the kitchen area. We could see each other. Sure. Still. I'm telling you 40, 40 minutes went by. Okay. Uh, and uh, and uh, I was just like, okay. And I'm just soft voice, not so much eye contact every now and then look at it, but at least there was no barking anymore. There was no growling. There was no backing up. And finally I was like, well, I'm not going to stress this guy out and put a leash on him and take him outside. You know, but I had five more minutes of the visit and I thought, if anything, at this point, he doesn't go potty. And on our update, I let dad know he didn't go potty because I did not want to stress him. We at least took, we calmed down. He wasn't barking. He wasn't fearful. And so I'm grabbing my stuff. I was like, all right, I'm going to head out. Guess who comes behind me with his toy? <laughs> I was like, Hurley, are you kidding me? Okay, okay. So I took the toy. I was like, you want to go outside? The tail kind of wags. Yeah. At his pace, I put the leash on. We went outside. So obviously, this is part of our core value where we go the extra mile. So yes, I went over the visit. But at the end of the day, it's about the pet's happiness and his comfort. And yeah. so dad, even the people at the leasing office are like, yay, clapping. They're like, Shoot. I don't know. I don't know. Um, that just says a lot right there that the leasing office saw us walking by and was clapping. <laughs> so that to me, hmm. that right there, um, gaining a pet's trust is everything. But it's going at his pace. And if I would have had to leave the visit without taking him outside, then that's what we do. And that's that's really what it is. It's paying attention. It's being mindful and not forcing them into that situation because that that first initial couple handful times you meet that pet, you're going to be cementing in their mind about what this relationship is going to shape up to be. And you could do a lot of damage in those first couple times, or you could make a lot of progress. And just like in this going, okay, look, uh, hands off, eyes down, ignore, and I'm going to watch his body language and seeing that he laid down, okay, he's relaxing or whatever and going, okay, well, this this is how far I made it this time. And maybe I've got to clean up a peep uh, spot next time I'm, I'm in, but we've made it this far. And then trying the next time or in this time, you know, being able to successfully do that and always being mindful of how much we're pushing pets into situations that they don't want to be. We may want them to go on that walk. Because that's what the pet parents told us to do. But if that pet is sitting there going, ain't no way, going, okay, well, 
Today, we didn't get to do that. Today, we did XYZ instead and being okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell our team that it's the fur clients. They're, they're our clients, the fur babies. The <laughs> parents just write the check. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the well, fur babies. We want to make them happy, make sure whatever's for their, and that's something I got to tell the parent, Hey, I think it's best. We do this. I've had a couple um, dog parents that, gosh, the leash just isn't the right leash for that dog. And I've mm. had to suggest to use the gentle lead, which I love for yeah. cooler. And they have, and it's life. They're like, Oh, this is life changing. My wife can now walk the dog. And so it's just guiding, again, educating, showing them. It, it, it is. And, it, and that helps. That helps when, when we're dealing with the fearful pets, like you had mentioned about the, 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 the client that you were talking about. Um, a lot of times we're dealing with a fearful client because the client knows about the pet's fearful tendencies and has a, a past or has had things happen to them. And now all of a sudden they're bringing that into this. And now we've got to address them. And that brings back this empathy with them. Where we're going, okay, I get it. It's, yeah, that's not fun to see this or hear these stories or to get these kind of photos. So what can we do about this? And we, we, we ease their peace of mind by providing excellent pet quality pet care to their pet. And that in turn helps them. And we get this kind of reciprocal thing going. Yep. Cause then mom's happy. That's what I say. We sell happiness, make the pet happy, makes mom and dad happy. And then it makes us happy. <laughs> now I know <laughs> from, <laughs> when I'm, when I'm talking with fearful pet parents, I know a lot of times I have to be very careful with how I word things and the kind of language that we use around them, especially in updates. I, I think that's really key. How do you walk that line between sending informative updates without freaking out the pet parents when, when things don't go quite as well as you had hoped? We always, I say, we try to always be positive, but of course, sometimes you walk in and there's a spit up on the ground, on the rug, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So we always say, you know, um, we ran into a spit up and no worries, easy cleanup. Let them know one, it's been cleaned up. And it, in my meet and greets, I always ask what products do you prefer us to use if there ends up being accidents? So we like to know ahead of time. Um, but we let them know because we do want to keep them in the loop. If it is a, a tummy issue or something's coming up, we do, yeah. even though it's kind of negative, but we still, but we just let them know that it's been cleaned up. Um, something's been broken. Let's say over the holiday, we have two kitties that are fairly young and must've jumped up and knocked over a frame and it broke. Mm. And so again, we, we want to mention this because they're going to find out when they get home. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> <laughs> so we mentioned there. it in a positive way. I think there was a kitty party last night. There was they were raging. <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody's good. We cleaned up, but we left a photo on the kitchen counter for you. You know, <laughs> they yeah. Think yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's we can tell that story, make sure it's informative. And I think what's key part of that is when especially when you're dealing with fearful clients who have had bad experiences in the past, not just telling them that something happened, but telling them what you're doing about it or what you've changed because of that information, how you're adapting. That I think is really more than just okay, I'm communicating that the problem happened, right? We had explosive diarrhea everywhere. If that's all, okay, what do you, what, <laughs> what else is in that? That's where we start building that trust. Cause not only did you tell me now I can see how helpful you're going to be for me and, and that you are the professional that you claim to be because of the next steps that you're going to t tell me. Yep. It's been taken care of. We're just letting you know what happened and it's been taken care of. Yeah. You mentioned a word earlier about one of your core values. And so I did want to know what your core values are in your business. We have four core values. They are, we do the work, we go above and beyond, we make no excuses, and we keep our word. To be honest, just about, I'd say a year, maybe a year and a half ago, I am now living, because these are not only my business core values, but they're also my personal core values. But okay. now I am hiring and firing in the business according to these core values. And before I think I was a little bit more lenient, like, oh, okay. But now it's, I hire as long as we align with these core values. Mm -hmm. And I also fire if for some, half, for some reason I, I missed and I see that your core values and my core values aren't meeting where they should for our service-based business. It's a service-based mentality. 
Yeah. Then um, I fire where need be. How do you go about finding out that match? Are those simple questions or those conversations? Do you have a, a Google form that you've designed for kind of each one of these to get some idea? Or what, what's it like deciding, okay, this person is or isn't aligned? So I actually list them on our job description for any time I'm hiring. I list them. And then at all our meetings, I mention them, I bring them up, and I remind everybody, you know, on the team that remember, and, and sometimes it's not necessarily exactly the way I said it, but I always say, remember, we go the extra mile, which is we go above and beyond. Yeah. Um, we do the work. It's also the same thing. We, we do it. It's not, there's no excuses. You make no excuses. <laughs> you know, you say you're going to be somewhere, then you be there. And I think that is part of it, reminding it, because again, this, it flows from us, right? We're the, the visionaries. It's our business. We're hiring people into this and it's our job, not only to be empathetic and managing and growing and kind of nurturing them well, it's also in, in training and guiding them in the values that we hold. And that takes reminding. It's reminding and showing and telling and then showing and telling some more and then repeating. Because every situation that comes up, I'm sure you've got, okay, this is a learning experience. New thing happened. You are able to sit and go and reflect how this falls in your four values, how you're going to handle it. But now it's now we have to teach other people about that. And how are they going to view that and remind them about that process? And it, it can be, I'm sure it can be tedious to go, okay, it's the same four. They didn't change since yesterday, but here we go again. <laughs> again. But sometimes, yeah. so, sometimes you have to do that as new things come up. Yeah. And you know, you really, like you said, how do I hire with that? It's, I mention it and I, I'm very upfront, especially in the interview process, I'm really upfront and say that we are very much an entrepreneurial mindset group mm. because you do still end up working solo. I'll train you, but you end up going on your own. There's nobody that's going to be behind you to pick you up, you know? And so, um, and if these four core values are an issue, Hey, no hard feelings. If you need to get up and leave right now, I completely respect that. Mm. If there's any issue with that. So I give them that, that, that shot to, to see. And most of the time they're like, okay, well, no, no, I love this. And it's, you can tell when somebody is, they have compassion and they're pet lovers and pet driven. You can just tell there's something, and I'm very intuitive. So I can pick up in this, with this pretty easily. Yeah. Cause you could also tell the ones that are not so much in it for the pets and they're in it more for the pay, I guess, yeah. which there's some, you know, they're trying to just make ends meet and that's fine. But in this position, we're going into so many people's homes and lives that I'm extremely particular in that. that you're, mm. It's not just about pay. It's about, it's mostly about the pets. Getting back to that motivation. And now, now we see this holistic approach here going, okay, I'm starting with people's motivations. Their motivating factors are going to influence their ability to align with the core values of my business. Because one of the core values that I did not see in here was make as much money as possible regardless of ethics and morals. But that, that wasn't on here um, <laughs> for a very mm -hmm. good reason. Yeah. But, there, but there are people who may try and get a job just to get a job to get money. Not that that's bad because people need to pay bills, but we have to go take a step back and go, whoa. There's some other things we have to screen through first. Yes, I'm going to pay you, but I'm going to pay you in this way. And this is how we're going to be structured. And this is how we're going to act in these scenarios. And I, for, for us, you know, we spend some time during our interview process kind of walking through a couple case studies of like, hey, this thing happened. This is how we handled it. Just to give them some idea, a little bit of flavor of the business and our expectations for them and to help set up a little bit of that before they get in. But I know sometimes that's hard to communicate mm -hmm. to people. The core values that you have here, when did you start implementing those? Were those, did you have those since 2014 or did they kind of develop over time? I did not have those since 2014. I think I had those subconsciously for my personal self. It's just the way I led my life. Yeah. But for the business, I, in the last year and a half, I came to find out that, wait a second, you know, if I was to intentionally use this towards the business, I think we'll go to a different level. It really does show that, that, that tight alignment. Again, it's our business. And now I, I'm sure you feel, uh, you tell me, but like you feel a lot more probably in, in energetic and invigorated with your business, knowing everything's here. I don't have to be a different person whenever I'm on work mode versus personal mode. 
I can make, it's easier for me to make decisions in the scenario because I'm true to myself and true to who I am. And it's able, better able for me to, to live in this lane as opposed to having to spend all this energy to be something different or think different or, or all that kind of thing because it ends up being who, who we are, right? We don't have to be faking it or feel like we have to fake it. Right. I don't have to switch hats and be like, hold on, it's this Stephanie or is this, uh, you know, stay home pet sitting business owner, you know? <laughs> so I actually think it's, like you said, it's more genuine. It's more real if it's actually Stephanie. And I am the owner of stay home pet sitting and my core values are the same for personal and business. And it just aligns. Do you feel like that's one way that core values help us focus in our business because we're able to stay true to ourselves? I think so. It actually helped me and um, it helped me make a decision mm. at one point to where I had a sitter that was coming out of training. And so she was about to go in the field on her own coming out of training. And she made a comment and I read, it just didn't align with our core value. And I thought, oof, it's like, I felt it in my stomach. It just didn't sit right with me. I was like, Okay, it and it didn't sit right because it didn't align with my core values, which are the same ones for the business. And so mm. I gave her the opportunity, and it was something that was going against service based. You know, it, it was less about providing great service to the client and the pet, and it was more about her and, and compensation. And so I I had a conversation with her just to understand and before making a decision. But at the end, it's like when that voice in your in your gut, in your head just gets louder and you know what you have to do. And I finally then decided and I said, you know what? You can't get the reward that you want if you don't take control. And mm. so and so my my gut was telling me what to do. I was just trying to fight it. And that's where I had to make the choice that even though she just got out of training, I had to let her go. You're right. When we, when we are aligned, we've got those, it is easier to make not easy. Those kind of decisions are never easy on us, but we do probably have a lot more clarity around that. And you're able to focus on, oh, it's this issue. It's this thing. Cause I think we've all been in those scenarios where you've picked up a new client or hired a new staff member and something just feels off about it. And it's hard to describe sometimes of going, well, I just, I don't know. And, and to be able to have these core values to go, Oh, <laughs> oh, we do the work. Oh, the reason I'm having a trouble with this client or with a staff member is because they're not showing up. They're not doing the work. That clarity and that focus onto those particular issues help us communicate it now to them to either address it, to fire it, to manage them, to you know do something with that feeling that we have. Yeah, exactly. And it, and it's and now so that's why I say it from the very beginning. It's on the job description when you apply and you hear it at every meeting and I talk about it. It's something that we live by. It's something that we go by. So um, it works. It is. It, it is. It is that, that that guiding factor in light. If people are sitting or listening to this and they don't have core values in their business, what are some recommendations or, or pointers that you would give to them to go about finding them for their business? I think it's just a matter like I didn't know. I, I think I'm sure I had these all along. I just never put them into words to really figure them out. But everybody has something like somebody might say, um, like I could easily add, add to communication. It's huge for me. It's huge. And so if if you need your staff to communicate or if you need, you know, also your staff to communicate to you, to each other, to the clients, thoroughly well in a timely manner, then maybe that's a core value, mm. you know? Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out, cause I think it's different for everybody, but figuring out what are the must haves, what are the non-negotiables that you must have for your business or for yourself. Right. And that's, that's, what's really key here too. I'm, I'm glad you said that because it's not just if we are, hiring staff that we need these core values. If we're a solopreneur out there, the core values can, are going to be essential for guiding us in those decisions when we're growing, expanding, taking on new clients, changing services, when we are needing to, to reflect on ourselves. Those core values help us in those moments. So it's not just, oh, do I need to fire this person or hire this person? It's what decision do I need to make? Because sometimes 
uh, I'm really tired and I don't make the best decisions when I'm tired. <laughs> but if I've got some core values on a wall over here that I can point to and reflect on, that helps me. That helps ground me in those times of turmoil or when I'm, when I'm scared or when I'm nervous. It's a reminder of, okay, that's what I'm working towards. That's who I am. And I can go from there. Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking us through your your business, how we can be more empathetic with our staff and clients, and really what it means to go that extra mile and help and build trust with fearful staff, clients, and pets. But I know that there's a lot more that you do and uh, there's a lot more going on. So how can people get connected with you and follow along with everything that you're doing? Yeah, so... They can find me on Instagram or my personal Instagram is Steph, S-T-E-P-H-C-0509. And then the pet sitting Instagram, all of it is stay home pet sitting. That's for Instagram. That's for Facebook. And then we even have a Facebook group, the one I was mentioning, which is stay home pet sitting and house sitting. Stephanie, again, this has been a real pleasure. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Empathy drives us for a lot of reasons. It drives us to do our services well, drives us to set up the services to be meeting the exact needs of our clients. It drives us to seek out more education and training, to seek out bettering ourselves time and time again. It drives us to continually meet and do our core values of our business so that ultimately what happens is our empathy allows us to make hard decisions because we are connected with our why in our business and we never lose sight of that. When we get out of alignment with our why, with our empathetic nature towards our clients, towards our pets, it's harder and harder to make those tough decisions because we don't know which way to turn. And that's why taking care of yourself feeding yourself, investing in yourself is so important because empathy will run out when we are tired and exhausted and we can't move another step forward. So setting those boundaries allows you to protect that empathetic nature that you have and allows you to continue moving forward. We want to thank today's sponsor, Time to Pet. And thank you so much for listening. We can't tell you how much it means to us that you listen, that you share, that you engage in the community. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll be back again soon.